If you would turn, please, to the first of the readings that we had in Isaiah chapter 1. And I draw our attention to verse 18, very familiar, well-known verse. Come now, and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. The title of the sermon is being reasoned with, being reasoned with. And that is what scripture does, doesn't it? And that is what God does with, with us. He reasons with us. You'll notice as we uh, began that section in Isaiah 1 verse 10, hear, hear the word of the Lord. And the context is rather well, sober context. It is the hypocrisy of, of that day and the absence of real meaningful spirituality in the worship. And God declares in no uncertain terms his abhorrence with it. But then he reasons with them. And if he can appeal and make reason, please to those of such stubbornness and of such recalcitrance, well then how much more we should take courage, encouragement from the fact that he reasons with you and with me as non-Christians, but he still reasons with us as Christians. It's primarily in that latter sense that I'm taking this text uh, this morning to preach upon. But whereas so many would try to make uh, aspects of faith uh, mystical matters and well beyond the ability of words to express it or communicate it, God begs to differ. And this book, book, no, book, begs to differ. And it's full of reasoning. And it's full of arguments and exhortations and appeals that it makes to us as thinking, reasoning people. That it would speak to us, not conjure up some strange mystical atmosphere as though that would be sufficient to create the change in us that's needed. The Lord gives us words. He gives us his word. The word made flesh. Well, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. God speaks to us, doesn't he? There are proofs and examples, principles, warnings, promises that are for us to hear. Here on this day of all days, but here every day. Turn the pages of scripture. He is there, gaining our attention, looking to rivet and focus our attention to drive us away. And, well, this is the fact, isn't it, from our tendency, still as Christians, and this we'll dwell upon at length later on, but still as Christians, to be very unreasonable and very unreasoning. And we sometimes afresh have to hear this wonderful appeal and believe it. That's the different thing, isn't it? And believe it. That we hear it and we believe it. Because there are others who would say, well, listen to me. There are others who would say, behold, come let us reason together. And in that, we're more likely hearing so often the voice of Sambalat or Tobiah trying to induce Nehemiah to cease his work, to stop having his confidence in the Lord, believing those things that, well, he does understand. But then when others come with a different voice, we can be momentarily thrown or more than momentarily. So he compels us to listen. And the Lord speaks with words we can understand. As we have them rendered into our own native tongue, we can understand. But he doesn't speak to us in some secret code or riddles. Oh, there are some that would so cast mystery over the plain word of God that you would need to have expertise in crosswords of the most cryptic kind or Sudoku puzzles of the most taxing of species before you would dare to embark upon studying the word of God. As though they alone, and there are plenty of people out there who would claim some expertise in unravelling these mysteries, letting you into the secrets of it. Well, that's Gnosticism, friends. That's Gnosticism. No, God doesn't speak in code riddles, lack of clarity, but it's very, very clear. 
and the options, the choices are very, very clear. And it's sin. Sin objects. Sin is that which, left on its own, will never be reasoned with. Friend, unless the Spirit of God come upon you and me with power to change us, to make us actually reasonable people, to make us capable of following well, what is already there, but we can't see it because of sin, but what is there, the compelling logic of biblical reasoning. God is a God of truth. God is a God of logic, impeccable, wonderful logic. And when followed, it leads to such contentment and peace of heart. Those who castigate us of just being bogged down in words have a clue. This is truth, and the truth makes us free, doesn't it, dear friends? But it's sin that stands in the way, and we also have an adversary who stands in the way. So my first heading is this. There is something in these verses for the Christian to hear. Well, these verses, isn't it? I should bring this this evening for the, the gospel sermon, because it's, it's so clear and such a promise, such a wonderful application the contrast, the difference that it makes when the Lord Jesus Christ takes away, underline the words, takes away the sin of his people. The thoroughness of it, the completeness of it, the perfection of it. Well, it leaves nothing whatsoever undone. And here, as the Lord reasons with us, he reasons on the basis of a wonderful promise that then was in the prophet's eye to be fulfilled in the future, but which the saints of that day could avail themselves of in, in, in the kind of past tense, but already the promise was there and will work for them in that day. But how much the more when the full sunshine is upon us and we survey the wondrous cross, we see our Lord Jesus Christ and what he does for sin and sinners, the difference that he makes and to hear that and for us to come now it's as though we're in a different place and we need to be drawn away from it and as soon as we surely do we're perishing we're being lost but dear friends you've come this morning and you're not a christian but that's that's the truth you're you're lost and you're you're perishing you're far from god and the, your issue is your sin because it is there in the sight of god as something unmissable. We, we rather hope that God is negligent and, and, and doesn't really notice. Uh, your friends may not notice uh, when you told a lie perhaps. Your friends may not notice when uh, there's been a, an angry thought in you, some jealous thought that's animating you. You may, you may keep it well concealed, maybe, but not from God, you don't. And the, the colour of sin is very striking. and It's there in verse 18, isn't it? It's, it's scarlet, it's red, like crimson, it, it's unmissable. It, it's so glaring and obvious and so present that it cannot just be somehow lightly scrubbed away. It's a stain so deep running right through our whole nature, our thinking, our desiring, our, our will, that it just cannot be erased by human work or invention. It cannot be removed by all the religious observances that we might care to follow. There is only one person who is able to do this, and it was his blood that was red like crimson, and that was scarlet. But that blood of one pure, who truly was white as snow, and was as wool, who himself had no sin that he had to die for, that he did not appear before his father with just this glaringly obvious problem of, of the human heart, the human soul in its rebellion against God, not he. And he made himself there to be our representative, to bear our sin, to carry it, to die for it, because it cannot be erased. It cannot be erased in, in time if it's not been forgiven and not been taken away by him, then we carry it into eternity. And we carry it, therefore, to hell. And it remains on our record forever 
and forever. And there is no more solemn truth that you'll hear from a preacher than that. And that will be our lot. And that will be the conclusion of us, or rather the continuing experience that will be ours, knowing that we remain, as such, offenders against the law of God, a law that is God himself. It's not as if it's an abstract code in which he has a, a kind of half-hearted interest. It is the expression of his character. He is a God of truth. He does not lie. He is a God who respects us, therefore he doesn't steal from any. He is a God of, of holiness and compassion. And that is who he is. And the word of God and the laws and the commandments are a reflection of who he is. And so when we break those commandments, and we all do in word, in thought, in deed, then the record remains. The offence remains. It is against the great king. And that offence is therefore very deep very personally felt by God, as though each act we had done, though we may not think we're doing it in the sight of God, but we are. It's as though we defy him and say his laws are not good, that he is not good. And such offence can only be paid for by our own blood unless another comes and intervenes on our behalf, and one has. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And if, if you're not converted, I, I, I must urge you, put all your trust in him. Because he will do what is prophesied here. That he'll take your sin and my sin. And though it be a scarlet, it's so obvious, it is so there, so pertinent and glaring, cannot be removed, it's so deeply stained. But it will become white as snow. That is such a contrast, dear friends. White as snow. You can't even see it. I had a, a jumper. Oh, got a stain on it, didn't I? Just uh, put it through the washing machine a few times there. Ah, I can still just see a faint trace of it. Um, oh, sad. But not with this. This is thorough and complete and that the worst critic could look at it and say, in fact, it is this person, the, the things they'd said, the things they'd done, the things they'd thought. And now in the sight of God, the record is clear. It's white as snow, and though it's red like crimson, it shouted at you. It demanded justice. It, it required of it a punishment for this. But now that's all been lifted. And you see, it says wool, pure wool, beautiful, clean, white, if you will, wool. And that is the difference that he makes. That's the difference he makes. So if you're unconverted this morning, that's the difference he can make to you. And I urge you, I urge you, come to him. You hear, hear him reasoning with you, come to him. But as Christians too, we may have received of this. Ah, yes, when our eyes first beheld him, saw what the cross did, what that blood of Christ accomplished. Well, it may have moved us to the very depth of our being, and I rather hope it did. And yet, we go on in the Christian life, and it's sometimes as though we have forgotten something as straightforward, something as basic and elementary, something as good as what we read here, and what the Lord has done for his people through the Lord Jesus Christ. That other voices come, and they reason with us, and they persuade us, and we listen to them, and the peace that we should have. You notice the next verse, if ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. As should be the Christians, not in that, in that way, we put it in spiritual terms there, but to enjoy peace and to enjoy great comfort and joy in the soul. But if somehow our sins Though they were as scarlet white as snow, they're beginning to get a tinge of scarlet back. And though in the sight of God they are as wool, it's somewhere in our thinking, we're believing that he's seeing them a little bit more red like crimson than the benefits of eating the good of the land will cease to be our enjoyment. And we will feel more that uh, we have uh, the sword against us, as in verse 20. We've actually refused to hear something of the promise of God. 
that is solemnly made to us in his Son, solemnly given to us, and the Son solemnly, in his dying agony, said it is finished. But something in us, in someone else who speaks to us, would somehow want to undo that and start an inquest and begin uh, a a fact-finding mission that only takes us into a lack of comfort and a lack of peace. So my next heading, too good to be true, question mark. Too good to be true? This news that we have that in Christ, whatever you were before you were converted, whatever I was before converted, you, you can name anything that you have done, anything that you thought that you were, and it has been atoned for. It has. That is why he came. He didn't come to do away with certain kinds of sins, but not those. He did not come to address that particular matter, but not those. So there's some exemptions. There were none. And it, all of it, there as we confessed and repented, and perhaps with tears, repented and received with gratitude, mercy, and derived perhaps some assurance from that, maybe then or subsequently. That's true. And yet we can be somehow left in perplexity, wondering, is it too good to be true? Good news, gospel, good news, but is there something I've missed here? And we can be very frail, very feeble creatures, can't we? And sometimes we we can think, well, I'm such an uneducated person, and I haven't gone to the right school, the right college, I've not sat under the right sort of university instruction there, and, and, and I can get things very wrong. I can get things absolutely around my neck. Perhaps I've misunderstood. Because there are enough people out there who stand in pulpits who would say that what I've just been saying, no, not true at all. That's not true at all. The Bible doesn't say that. It doesn't talk about sin in that way. You shouldn't worry. God doesn't judge in that way. No, don't worry. And, well, Christ was a good example, surely. But this, all this blood sacrifice, oh, that's so past. And we're modern people, 21st century. We don't do this anymore. And you might think, well, perhaps I missed something here. Perhaps I've not got this quite right. I'm, I'm so easily confused. I'm so dumb when it comes to so many things. Perhaps here I've missed something. Oh, dear friend, don't let that be you. <laughs> Come now, let us reason together. And if it must be that once more, that reasoning, going back to this basic fact of what Christ has done for sinners, and what this whole book with all the sacrifices it speaks about tells of the importance of the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin without it. Oh, no, you've seen it absolutely right. Forget all those theologians. They do not know. Forget all those clever people. They simply do not know. This is something, this is a spiritual truth that's spiritually discerned. And you spiritually discerned it because there, when you were brought to him, he showed you, he taught you. This doctrine, you realize, came from God. And it's Bible doctrine. And you loved it. And you believed it and trusted it. And you must go on believing it and go on trusting him. Now, you haven't seen it wrong. You, you, you've seen it right because God was there giving, giving you vision, giving you insight. Nothing has changed and nothing should come in and interfere with your enjoyment of that. Oh, we read Romans chapter 8, didn't we there, that um, concluding portion. And it's as if there Paul reasons with us, doesn't he, as the Spirit of God inspires him in how to to address us. And he has a series of, of questions there, doesn't he? And he answers them all emphatically. And it's as though he's anticipating your situation and, and my situation and, and our witness and our, what well, is it really quite as good as I've heard it? And he would say, yes, it is. So Romans 8, verse 31, what shall we say then to these things? He invites objections here. Is anybody going to reason against us? Well, he's got better reasoning than any can bring, and it comes by way of, a, of another question. If God be for us, who can be against us? That rings out, doesn't it? That answers it perfectly. God has spoken, and if on the cross the Lord Jesus spoke and said it's finished, 
And if the resurrection is showing us, amongst other things, that it's received in heaven, then really, who are we to argue? God before us, who can be against us? And Paul carries on reasoning with us. And he's doing. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So when the questions come, the doubts and the fears intrude, but he's got help for us then and promises for us then for the pilgrimage. So we can draw comfort from that. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? So I continue, the devil will. The devil will try. And at times our own guilty consciences shouldn't necessarily be guilty consciences, but we manage to import guilt at times like nothing else, and we lay charges against uh, ourselves there. But note, it's God that justifies, declares us righteous, who speaks that. Not anybody else, not a representative, it's he himself, and he's speaking to us through his son. And so who is he that condemneth, verse 34, well, it's Christ that died, yea, rather it's risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. It seems as if it's all covered there, doesn't it? It seems as if every of those key aspects of the Lord's ministry covers it, has some comfort in it, some truth to impart to us, to make us reasonable again, to bring us back to biblical reasoning and shake us out of any fears and doubts we had that we missed it it's too good to be true Paul is saying to us it is good and it is true and it's very true and it is all of it underwritten by God himself and so he proceeds doesn't he there that uh, nothing and he lists all the possible things you might want to bring to bear in verse 35 and then in in verse 38 so we notice there angels principalities powers our enemy the devil but no he can't he can't do it either because this cannot be changed. God has spoken. God holds his people, keeps them, gives us all things for this pilgrimage. Too good to be true? No, <laughs> true in every respect. But then, oh, we do play mind games with ourselves, don't we? And sometimes we can think this, that it really will be spoiled if we hear this and believe this too much, that, that it will spoil us, that it will tilt us into becoming antinomians. We will be careless. It'll make us careless and, and we'll offend against God and we will we'll kind of drift into a kind of apostasy because we believed it too much and it spoiled us and made us careless and not looking to his commandments and walking carefully before him. Well, dear friend, let me say, it's the opposite, it's true. <laughs> it's the opposite, but it's true. If we would be holy, if we would want to know how to live the commandments of God, then we do well to do it, fully persuaded of the grace of God, of the power of that forgiveness and the totality of it, to be fully persuaded that there is forgiveness each day, for we know ourselves too well. We, we do err. We, we do sin. Our words, and they come out, and they're done, they're said, and we think, why? How did I say that? What? What induced me to that? And grief and confusion of heart is ours. Yes, we, we, we know that. But we also know that that blood didn't just forgive us once, but it goes on forgiving and forgiving again. And it doesn't spoil us. In fact, we, if anything, end up appreciating the Lord Jesus more, respecting him more, that he forgives Christians, and we rightly at times lament, we should know better, we should do better than this, uh, but we don't. And we go back to him. And I find, and I hope you find, that there is mercy. And he receives me again with that same old fear, or that same expression of unbelief, that same ugly pride. And I'm back again. And I found something else maybe from back along, some bad attitude from my teenage years that travel along sort of undetected it's there and I'm confessing that and I find him such a friend such a confidant and one who's there with sympathy and with power not to leave me there but to take me on from there and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness that we have that advocate above the Christ the righteous one so when we sin 
we have him. And he atoned there, didn't he? Not for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. All the all Christians that ever have been, are, and ever will be. And we shouldn't think that we hear this grace, this mercy. It doesn't spoil us. It'll ruin us. No, actually, the more we appreciate that grace and that mercy, the more we cherish him. And the more we want to do what he wants us to do. And we do it more willingly, actually. And we do it with less soul search and diffidence. We do it more gladly and follow in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake more swiftly because we're appreciating him more. And sometimes as Christians, we have to be brought to a low place to appreciate more that grace, to cherish him appreciate him, respect him. Oh, we don't sin as we sinned before after that. We sin too much now. He's reasoned with us and we've seen for sure our sins as Christians. Oh, they were a scarlet. How could we offend against such light? And yet still the promise is there. There is white as snow. Gone. Not held to our account. We've confessed, surely. We've repented, there's been a desire to change, surely. And then the application of that blood has once more rendered them white as snow. Red like crimson, they shall be as wool. No, it's not too good to be true. It's true and it's good because it actually works towards our holiness and actually makes us hate sin more in the world and its emptiness and see through it more. Oh, value. The things of God, that much more. My next heading, I must move on. Do not lean on the devil for help. Do not lean on the devil for help. Don't let him secretly, unawares, he can creep in. And he ends up offering to be your and my advocate. (laughs) And that he will speak on our behalf. But he does not speak well or helpfully. And he never begins on proper, true, biblical reasoning and premises. He'll try and move the ground and take us over somewhere else. And here I say this carefully, very often. And and isn't it right that we should have a sensitive conscience, surely? And actually, as Christians, conscience has become more sensitive and more tender for the right things and the weighty things. But we can be oversensitive, and the devil can play on that. And what once was white as snow suddenly becomes scarlet because we've, we've embroiled ourselves into some unhelpful, fresh rules. And people out there and churches are forever inventing new rules for you and me to worry about. Something else to have to think about. And what once looked straightforward becomes confused. Why well, the charismatic movement introduced a whole raft of new things, new experiences that you and I should have. And some of them were very strong about it. And if you don't have them, you're blaspheming against the spirit. And that gets our attention, doesn't it? But no, they were offering us burdens on our consciences, weights that they were loading us with, which actually they themselves couldn't lift, and just embroiling us in a needless worry. But good friends are sensitive consciences. We want to do the will of God, but we can be led down the garden path and inventing, I'm afraid, uh, scarlets and red like crimsons, worrying ourselves, holding above ourselves here, an experience we haven't had, tongue speaking that never came. Well, dear friends, don't let it come either would be my advice. But there are those who advocate these things, but they do not, I think, advocate on behalf of the Lord. We're loaded down. See through them. Be bold enough to say no. That's not in the word of God. That is not what scripture is saying. Be prayerful. Take the scripture to him. Ask for understanding if you're struggling with that one, for instance. Oh, and, uh, and this day, and, uh, and here we have to see it amongst uh, what we call the new Calvinists there, this uh, critical race theory. Right? Critical race theory that uh, well, I survey this room carefully here with my dear friends by their ruling and verdict. We're, we're all done. We are a most terrible, oppressive group of people. And if you don't know it, well, that just shows how oppressive you are. And there are a lot of people in churches who are being taught that from pulpits. And, uh, well, uh, each individual sinner must repent of their sin, whatever their race, whatever their background. Big, big subject. Can't address it all this morning. 
But to hold that, to invent, as it were, a guilt that now has become the new scarlet, a kind of new appearance there, that which we thought was good and we could have a good conscience about. But no, suddenly something's opening up there. Again, come before the Lord and take biblical reasoning to answer these questions and read the, the better speakers on these subjects. Big one. It's out there and it's affected the UK a bit more in America, I guess, but everything comes this way, doesn't it, in the end? No, do not lean on the devil for your help. Don't let him be your advocate. So my final heading, do not let the past hold you or me captive. That we can be persuaded of what we read in Isaiah 1 verse 18, be comforted and be assured, and then something can happen. We go to a place of past moral failure. We see somebody who reminds us of past sin. Or where maybe we said something wrong, unkind. And all of a sudden, we are feeling so weighed down, so unhappy in our soul. Time of the year, an anniversary, it comes around. And every time it comes, we dread its approach because of what happened then, what we said, what we did. And we feel keenly that. And it can rob us of our peace. And we have to be reasoned with again. One has to look at the Apostle Paul. If there was ever a man who, in a way, his past would have haunted him wherever he went, I guess it was he. That in Jerusalem, he must have looked on occasion, perhaps, uh, as a Christian, and remembered, oh, I, oh, that's where we stoned Stephen there, and I consented to his death and held the clothes of those who threw the stones at him. It could have been crippling. He, he could have been immobilized and stopped from preaching could have felt a, a, a reproach upon himself when he stood before people. And they thought, oh, dear, your father, your mother, I remember imprisoning them. In fact, uh, they were put to death. Well, it could have been anniversary after anniversary. They just weighed upon him and left him quite unable to proceed. Except we know that it didn't. And he hadn't lost the past and its control and its hold in a way that ruined him or made him unfeeling or in a sense, lacking compassion. Nobody seems to have more compassion and warmth of hearts than this man as he writes to the churches. No, it, it didn't ruin him, didn't spoil him. But it can unhinge us. There's no one answer to it all, uh, though the answer really is there in, in verse 18, but how you apply that and how it finds its way to you and me can, can vary, vary quite dramatically. But if I just speak from my own little bit of experience, as, uh, as you friends here have had a, an interesting a year or two previously, and perhaps just uh, coming to a happy conclusion in these last few days, uh, certainly in Derbyshire and Crouch, we, we have been through some interesting times. And uh, I've wept tears, tears of sorrow and tears of absolute joy on occasion. And in it all, God is at work. And when he is at work, and he is at work in, in the everyday, isn't he? He's at work in the trials. He, he is impressing something upon us. We're learning. We're growing. Uh, he's reasoning with us. Uh, how often it is, it's only in a trial that suddenly the Bible speaks. It's got something which, which we knew was true, but now we know it's true because we're in it. And we're learning and we're gaining the comfort. And we're finding he's a friend indeed to us. We take that truth and that experience of fellowship on with us further to face new and fresh trials ahead. And I've found this, actually. The past, ah, it's not so much there. It's impact things, perhaps, expectations, hopes, perhaps that never quite happened. Their effect, which was there somewhere, but that was found. No, that, that's, that's getting quieter. That world is, is dying to me, if you like. And the things of Christ... Well, I trust are larger, more real, more tangible, more precious. He's working. And he works actually in that way there to deaden those anniversaries and those moments where just there's buildings in London and other places that have a blue plaque. What happened there? Some great thing happened there. And all we can see is like a red plaque. You said this here. You, you did that here. And you look and it's, it's there and it's pressing us. Well, it need not. 
and go on working, go on praying, go on seeking, go on making your mind to absorb and conform to the word of God and its promises and its truth and it's as good as it says here and the half of it I couldn't tell you in the time that I have. And that will be, in God's time, an antidote and a help. And you'll look back, as I think I'm able to look back and say, look what the Lord has done there. Look what a change. That doesn't work the same on me now as it used to. And that is a reason again to return to God in praise. Bring it next Lord's Day, if that's been your experience this week. To praise him for it there, in the privacy, as it were, of your own communion with him. So being reasoned with, we must be ready to be reasoned with. And on the basis of the shed blood of Christ, finished work, a saviour who in all respects showed himself to be absolutely who we need, doing what we needed, and continuing to pray for us as we had in Romans chapter 8. So may God be all that you and I need through this week. And now, in these happier months perhaps, that you as a fellowship and perhaps we in Christ will so face that we may know this, that though our sins were as scarlet, that our white as snow, though they were red like crimson, now they are as wool.